Hi, you're listening to What's New Today and this is Sangeeta, your host from India. Every year in February, people from all over the world come together to help bird conservationists and scientists. And this event is called the Great Backyard Bird Count. Now, as part of this event, anybody who wants to participate in it uh, needs to step out, observe the birds they see around them and then open a specific app on their phone or on their laptop and enter all the information that they've seen about the birds around them. Now, you can do this from your balcony or your terrace or if you're up for something even more fun, you can go for a walk in a park, a garden or you could go for a hike in a forest nearby. Now, if you're like me and all that you know about birds is how to identify a crow, a sparrow, a pigeon, maybe a parrot and an exotic peacock, worry not, the uh, people who've organized this great backyard bird count, they've got a lot of handy tools that help us identify even very exotic variety of birds around us. Now this year in 2024, the GBBC or the Great Backyard Bird Count is to be held from 16th to the 19th of February. And so now if you're thinking, this sounds interesting, but I'm not really sure if I'm up for it. Why don't you go ahead and listen to this conversation, which was recorded last year and published last year in 2023. The project leader of GBBC Worldwide, she's also from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, joined us and she chatted with three children from different parts of the world. Hi, my name is Shravan. I am from Singapore and I'm nine years old. Hi, my name is Tanvi. I'm from Columbus, Ohio. I'm 10 years old. Hi, my name is Azia. I'm from India and I'm 11 years old. Hi, I am Becca Radomsky bish and I live outside of Ithaca, New York in the United States. I work at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and I am the project leader for the Great Backyard Bird Count. You literally need the full thing? Yes, so the Cornell Lab of Ornithology is one of three big organizations. There's another one called Birds Canada and one called National Audubon Society. And then we also have lots of other partners around the world. Birds Count India is one of them, but I am the person in charge of the project at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, yes. It must be a big responsibility to be in charge of something worldwide. Whoa! It is, it is. It's a lot of fun though, and it's so inspiring to me to see people like yourselves who live all over the world that are excited about this. And we all, for these four days, it's like we all come together, right? And we're all just telling each other what we see. I find it to be very inspiring. Welcome, Becca. Very happy to have you on this show. And welcome, Shravan, Tanvi, and Adya. I hope you guys have a lot of questions for Becca. But before that, in true What's New Today style, I would love to kickstart this episode with a quick bird quiz. Are we ready? Yeah. Question one. A lot of birds are not very fond of one color. Can you guess which color I'm talking about? Red. Orange. The correct answer is white. There are plenty of birds who are white doves and cranes, for example. That is very correct, but I really don't know why birds are not terribly fond of white. Becca, do you know if there's a reason for this? You know, I'm going to admit that I just cheated and Googled this while you asked the question because I didn't know the answer. <laughs> but um, <laughs> it sounds like um, white signals danger to birds, to some species of birds. And so they recommend not even wearing white when you go bird watching because the birds may try to stay away from you. But I don't know, actually, the, the you know, the deeper reason beyond that. Okay, so if we have to trust Google and if you want to be a part of GBBC, maybe, maybe we don't wear white and go out. Fabulous. Now on to the second question. How often do you think you can see teeth in birds? Always? Sometimes? Never? Never. Sometimes. Sometimes. Adya was right and the correct answer is absolutely never because birds don't have teeth. But Becca, how do birds chew their food if they don't have teeth? 
That's a good question. Most birds don't chew their food. Um, the <laughs> seed eaters will kind of chomp on the seed coats, and then they'll consume the, the meat inside of the, the nut or seed that they're trying to get at. Um, raptors don't chew their food. They tear it apart with their big pointy bills and then swallow larger chunks of, of meat pretty whole. So birds don't do a lot of chewing. They do a little bit of chomping with their beaks if they're seed eaters, but mostly they and are... They also, they also pierce into their food. Yes, absolutely. Wow, every time I think of sharks, right, there are those sharp teeth, the gleaming, glistening teeth that come to my mind, the teeth that you need to tear their prey. So I just wonder how sharp the, the beaks of birds must be because they play pretty much a similar role. Anyway, now on to our third and last question as part of this bird quiz, a very, very easy question coming your way. The house sparrow is amongst the most common birds that you can speak you can find across all continents in the world except one continent in which continent can you not find the common house sparrow antarctica antarctica yeah because it's the coldest place antarctica is inhospitable for everyone except penguins oh wait house sparrows are not found in singapore also Asia, yeah, there will be house sparrows, but not in Singapore. Yeah, I've seen the Eurasian house sparrow in Singapore. Eurasian tree sparrow, tree sparrow. Speaking of Eurasian birds, the other day I was doing this thing called Merlin Bird App. It's really cool. You can just upload a photo or a sound into it and then it'll tell you which bird it belongs to. It then took, it's taking a faraway picture of a crow and it told me it was a Eurasian jackdaw. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, so it misidentified it for you? Yeah, totally. I think here's a great place for us to understand what this Merlin Bird app is all about. Because that's the app that users or participants of the GBBC uh, can use as part of recording all the birds that they see. Yeah, so the Merlin Bird app is a tool that the Cornell Lab has designed and built, and it's what we actually encourage, especially first-time participants in the GBBC to use. And it is a tool that is not 100% foolproof, right? And people actually like to try to trick it sometimes. Pictures in particular are probably the least accurate in terms of identification because you can see how many birds look very similar and could be ID'd uh, closely because, you know, the quality of the picture is hard to get real sharp. I would encourage you next time that happens to try either recording the sound of the bird using Merlin because you can also use bird sound to ID and answering the questions. There's um three questions that Merlin Bird ID will ask you. So compare the answers when you try the different ways to ID the bird and see if it gives you any kind of a different result. But yes, it's not 100% accurate. I think for the pictures we say somewhere between 78 to 80% accuracy. So it, it's not 100% accurate. Thanks, Becca. So the three children who've joined us, um, Tanvi, Adya, and Shravan, they've done a little bit of reading about GBBC themselves. So. Tanvi, can you tell us what is the GBBC all about and what do people have to do during those four days? So they go out, go out for like at least 15 minutes over like a course of like four days and they look outside and see if there's any birds and then they count how many birds, they kind of like record their information. And then you upload this information onto that Merlin bird app that we were talking about earlier. Adya, can you tell us who can participate in this? Anybody can participate anytime. Bird Watch is specifically held only in February, but actually people can upload their photos of birds around the year. But I have a question for you, Becca. Why is yeah. it held specifically in February? Like, will it make a kind of any difference if it's on a different month every year or something? Yeah, that's a really good question. One of the reasons it's in February is that February is sort of a time really around the world where birds are just about to engage in one of their annual migrations. So in the Northern Hemisphere, it's winter time um, and a lot of our migrants are in the Southern Hemisphere. 
and vice versa right now in the southern hemisphere nesting season is starting to wind down birds have been nesting and some of those birds will start to take off again um, so it's really kind of a nice opportunity to get a snapshot of where birds are right before one of their big annual migrations um, and it's not the only bird count that we do every year we do another one in may we do one in the fall and then there's also something called the christmas bird count which they do in december and january so it's before this so one of the nice things about bird conservation is we have these counts at various times of the year, which allows us to kind of put a bigger picture together of where birds are when. Um, and this one just happens to be right before one of their big migrations. That was really very interesting because I had never really thought about why they were doing it in February specifically. I kind of understand why we should do it uh, four days at the same time across the entire world because you shouldn't be double counting birds but this is really interesting about why we do it in february as against any other time of the year but i've got a question for all the kids what do you think uh, scientists and bird conservationists like becca do with all of this information the people who organize the gbbc they can use the information to find out where birds are when and if any type of birds population is increasing or decreasing. Then they can put the pieces together and make a bigger picture of why the population is increasing or decreasing. They could find out where the problem is going on if there's a population decreasing. And then uh, for non-migratory birds, they could find out ideal habitats for them. So they could create these habitats. So the information, it can basically just give the scientists an idea of how many birds, what the population of the birds is, and they can see if it's actually healthy or endangered. They would use it to check if the bird population is increasing or decreasing, just like Adya said. It's really cool to see all of you kids wearing the hats of bird conservationists and scientists. Here's a question for Becca, uh, which I think a lot of listeners would anyway like to hear from the horse's mouth. Please tell us uh, who can participate in the GBBC and uh, really what do you all do with all this information that people like us can collect and share with you all. Uh, the GBBC is available to anybody, um, no matter where you live. And some people don't have quote unquote backyards, right? Maybe they have a beautiful patio um, like Chevron has there that I can see in the background. So it doesn't matter. You don't need to be in a yard per, per se or a garden. Um, wherever you are, birds are there and we want to know about them. So um, wherever you live, no matter what your space looks like, tell us what you see. And the um, the data is used for lots of different reasons. So all of this data goes into a big database uh, called the, the eBird database that's managed by eBird. And then scientists will download this data and use it for lots of different questions that they're trying to ask and answer. Um, as some of you can probably imagine, a lot of the questions these days revolve around climate change. Um, and believe it or not, we can use bird data to answer or at least get a better sense of what's going on in terms of climate. So um, last year in 2002, 159 peer reviewed scientific papers used this data. Um, and again, GBBC is part of a bigger database. All the information goes into one place and then scientists from around the world can download that data. Um, so I would say to listeners, get out there, participate, something that's fun for you and pretty easy, whether you, know, you do it by yourself or with your family or your friends, it goes and contributes towards something much bigger, which scientists can use to try and understand what's going on around the world in terms of bird populations and even you know, bigger questions like climate and how that that's influencing the planet. Thank you so much, Becca. This was really helpful. But listeners, this is not where this conversation ended. The three children had a lot of questions specifically about birds, not just GBBC, but birds in general, uh, which we publish in part two of this episode, which will come out uh, next Monday. But in the event, you want to start getting ready by downloading the apps that you need uh, for being a part of the GBBC. We've left links to the apps that the 
great backyard bird count people use it's in the show notes below i'll see you on monday and thanks for listening